Hello, I'm uh, going to talk about imaging of the pelvis. I'm Dr. Philip Robinson from the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. And in your other lectures that you're going to receive in this package, there'll be a lecture specifically covering the hips and the SI joints. So we're going to look particularly at the anterior pelvis. So during the next 20 to 25 minutes, we're going to um, be able to describe the anterior pelvis anatomy. We'll look at some of the defining imaging findings for acute injury. We'll list and compare proposed injury processes for chronic pain and define some of the imaging findings and significance uh, in chronic pain for symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, patients and for athletes versus non-athletes. So let's first look at the anterior pelvis anatomy. And if you look at a number of anatomical texts, it can seem quite simplistic. As you can see here, there are well-defined uh, junctions where muscles attach around the symphysis pubis and the anterior pelvis. But as you'll see, it's a bit more complex than this. If we first look at the biomechanics of that area, what does the anterior pelvis do? Well, it acts as a mechanical strut between the lower limb and the remainder of the spine, acting through the anterior pelvis, transmitting to the spine. And as you'll see in a moment, there's also an anterior tilt. And there are a number of shear forces extending through the symphysis and parasymphysial tissues. And this is particularly prevalent in athletes who uh, are in sports that change direction and also in single stance kicking. So as you'll see later, symptoms are prevalent in sports such as soccer, rugby, Australian rules football, and in American sports, it's seen in American football and also ice hockey. So rather than that simplistic anatomical diagram, it's more of a complex process. As you can see here with a number of sheaths, ligaments and tendons merging into this anterior pelvis where there are shearing forces extending along the lower abdomen, the inguinal canal and the adductor muscles. So let's work through that anatomy. First of all, we have the symphysis pubis which has a fibrocartilage interpubic disc, which is similar in structure to the disc in the spine, and is typically wider and shorter in females. Within the joint, the uh, cartilage can have a primary cleft, and you'll see why that's significant later on. And usually, um, this develops as a, a person ages, and as you'll see, a secondary cleft can be a sign of disease. The joint itself is then reinforced by ligaments, and this is uh, from behind the joint looking out, and there's a superior and inferior pubic ligament, again blending with the capsule, and here we have the pubic bodies. Looking down, we can see the pubic bodies again, and there are capsular thickenings posteriorly and anteriorly, again strengthening the joint with the disc centrally. But it's when you uh, move to the tissues surrounding the joint that things become more complex. And here we have the symphysis pubis centrally, and you can see that the adductor muscles and tendons attach along the capsule of the symphysis pubis, merge with each other, and even merge across with fascial uh, connections to the opposite adductor muscles. And then superiorly, this blends with the distal rectus sheath containing uh, rectus abdominis and pyramidalis, and coming in from the side, merging with the fascia of the inguinal canals. And there are various anatomical variants, which you can see in these uh, references. So there is variation um, between this, between men and women, and certain ligaments and fascial blendings don't occur. But you'll see when it comes to uh, chronic problems with the symphysis pubis, certainly in athletes, it's predominantly male athletes that are affected. And why that is, whether that's an anatomical problem or sport-related problem, isn't clear. We'll also briefly discuss postpartum injury, which of course affects women. So this complex merging of tissues can be seen on MRI. This is a high-resolution sagittal image at the level of the symphysis pubis disc. This is a bit of a bow marrow, but this is the disc, this is the bladder. And here we have rectus abdominis and pyramidalis, and you can see the tendon doesn't insert into the top of the bone, it wraps around the front of the disc and the capsule. And if we move to a slightly more sagittal position, 
You can see again, this is now we're into the symphysis pubis, the body of the pubis proper. We've got marrow signal here. And here's the capsule anteriorly blending again with the rectus abdominis and the ductal longus. So this junctional area of soft tissues with the capsule is an important area, as you'll see, both in acute injury, but also in chronic injury. You can see this on ultrasound. There's the adductor longus blending with the tissues anteriorly, and more inferiorly, we have the cortex of the pubis. But you can see you don't get that good separation and definition of the tissues as you do on MRI. So MRI really remains the imaging modality of choice for assessing this area. The pubis itself has a, an apophysis, which lies on the anteromedial aspect of the pubis. So here we have the body of the pubis, we have a chondral area, and here's ossification in the growth plate with the capsule lying more anterior. And this apophysis uh, is also the area where we get stress reaction uh, in uh, adult uh, population. And this apophysis, like the iliac crest, is a very late fusion. So uh, it can be still present in athletes up to the age of 23 years of age when all other apophyses have fused. And when it fuses, you can get an area of sclerosis in the bone marrow where it's more, uh, more sclerotic and less bone marrow fat. And so this is normal and again follows that anteromedial curvature. You can see it on CT scan. These are taken from uh, trauma scans. So these are incidental, this is normal. And you can see the way the apophysis interdigitates with the normal body of the pubis, and again, sits anteromedially. Ultrasound, you've got to be careful because this irregularity, as you can see here, which is totally normal because of uh, un uh, complete ossification, can look very irregular. This isn't an avulsion. This is just normal enchondral ossification. So what's the best way to image this area? Well, you can use your uh, typical anatomical planes, but over the years, uh, a number of institutions, including our own, have looked at high resolution, small field of view, angled uh, images through the anterior pelvis. So this anterior tilt that we have with the anterior pelvis, we go in the orthogonal plane to it. Um, other institutions have done slightly more coronal oblique, but we go for axial oblique. And we use a small field of view. We do typically do T1 weighted. We do then do PD and T2 weighted fat sat. Uh, we no longer do gadolinium. Gadolinium was in vogue years and years ago when the small uh, field of view and the signal to noise often gave poor quality imaging on T2 weighted sequences. But with improvement in coils and magnet technology, you don't need gadolinium any longer. And these are the sort of images you get here, some T1 weighted through the anterior pelvis. You can see the pubic bodies. And you can see that junctional area with the capsule, the adductor and rectus abdominis tendons, and more inferiorly, more the adductor and uh, capsular tissue. And this is the uh, T2 weighted. Again, you can see that old apophysis. You can see a bit of fluid. And then more inferiorly, again, you get beautiful detail of the symphysis pubis itself. So let's look at acute injury. If we're talking about stress injuries through this region, um, it's similar principles to the rest of the skeleton. Usually uh, runners or athletes, females are more predisposed because of the lack of muscular bulk surrounding the area. And quite often there can be injuries elsewhere that precipitate the change in training that also then precipitates the stress injury. And you can see here in this young footballer who's 16, there's a quite marked edema in the left pubis compared to the right. So what's going on here? Is this isolated symphysial change? No. In the remainder of his pelvis, you can see there's corresponding stress in the SI joint. So this is a stress through the pelvis generally. And this is a good diagnosis to make because the prognosis is excellent with rest and alteration in training. This will resolve. It's been written up recently that you can get an apophysitis, and you can see here uh, on a CT scan on the left, we have a normal apophysis quite closely applied to the pubis. Again, this is a young 16-year-old. Uh, and on the right, you can see there's widening of the apophysis, there's ill definition, and this was a, an acute uh, stress reaction through the apophysis itself rather than an avulsion. And here's the corresponding uh, MRI in a different uh, player. 
And again, you can see the normal apophysis on the uh, right in this case, and on the left, you can see the intense signal reaction across the physeal region with some reactive change in the body itself. And again, this is a good prognosis. Acute soft tissue injury, um, again, is usually in the athletic population, and it can be severe pain and swelling. And again, uh, because of that complexity of anatomical uh, location with the inguinal canal, uh, scrotum and other areas, you can get discharge of uh, hemorrhage throughout that region. So it can be quite alarming with a large scrotal hematoma. Imaging techniques, you can diagnose uh, acute tearing with MRI and ultrasound, but often with the complexity of the soft tissues, uh, MRI is e usually easier to get a global overview. And there's a recent reference here if you wish to look at uh, from 2017. So here we have an acute injury uh, in the symphysis pubis. Uh, this is a coronal sequence and we'll use that to landmark where we're going. You can see that there's uh, some ill-defined edema here in the soft tissues on the right. So if we go just above the symphysis pubis, you can see already the arrow showing asymmetry on the right, the rectus abdominis pyramidalis is swollen compared to the left where there's edema. You can also see that on the left inguinal canal compared to the right inguinal canal is enlarged and hemorrhagic. As we go further down, again, you can see the soft tissue adjacent to the symphysis pubis, the capsules disrupted, there's soft tissue edema, and more inferiorly, again, on the left, we have continuous low signal attachment here, whereas on the right, it's disrupted with edema. Ultrasound can be very difficult. Here we have somebody who's symptomatic in this area acutely, and there's a small hematoma, but you can get thickening, and as I showed you earlier on, bony irregularity is quite commonly seen on uh, ultrasound. Here's another player, and they're going through a coronal sequence, and uh, as we scroll through, you can see that, again, there's hemorrhage within the inguinal canal. As we go forward, there's hemorrhage again, involving rectus abdominis and the right inguinal canal. More marked on the right now. And here, and as we come into the symphysis pubis itself, you can see the two pubic bodies, which are relatively normal. You can see a nice low signal capsular structure with intact left-sided adductor attachment merging together, whereas here it's separated with an acute tear with hemorrhage into the adductor muscles. If we look at the same player in the oblique axial, as we come down, again, the symphysis pubis, pubic bodies are relatively normal, but it's this attachment and mergement of the capsule and adductor muscles that have stripped away, stripping into pectineus. This is the left pectineus, this is the right pectineus, and again, there's detachment of the capsule and the adductor, not just the adductor, the capsule uh, tissues have also been disrupted. Briefly mentioned postpartum injury, and typically uh, the symphysis pubis obviously goes through massive distraction forces during labor. Uh, the majority of uh, women uh, recover well, but some have some persistent ligament laxity and pelvic instability. And because of the relative frequency of, of abnormality on imaging, as you'll know from reporting pelvic x-rays, a clinical assessment uh, for clinically relevant findings is essential. Here you can see a separated symphysis pubis, and there was a vogue uh, for looking from in male athletes for this sort of separation using flamingo views, but really that's fallen out of vogue, because quite often, as you'll see later, in male athletes, uh, gross distraction does not occur. How is this treated? Well, if instability is bad enough, uh, they will go on to fixation and arthrodesis of the joint, and they may even require posterior fixation in some cases. And just to be aware of this, they can use bone grafts to augment screw purchase, so don't be caught out with the graft donor site and the elac crest. So the final part of this talk, we'll uh, discuss long-standing groin pain, and you'll see why that's the term I use in a moment. If we look in the literature, there are approximately 20-odd studies looking at uh, imaging 
of usually athletes with long-standing groin pain. And a number of these studies um, are, are suboptimal or have some form of deficiency in their methodology. They can be mainly case studies. Quite often they encompass different sports, ages and sexes within the same study. Uh, 15 include clinical examination, so five don't. Uh, quite often uh, they use different protocols throughout the study and only a small number assess inter-observer variation for reporting of supposed abnormalities. But the problem is compounded by the fact that what patients are referred into the studies because there's a large amount of diagnostic confusion and all these terms are terms probably for the same uh, condition but clinicians call osteitis pubis, some call athletic pubalgia, and doctor enthesopathy. These are all terms used in these studies, and we presume they're probably the same thing, but again, we don't know that they definitely are. And that's why the uh, Doha Agreement, as referenced here from 2015, um, was a consensus statement that wished to term uh, pain in the groin is long-standing rather than trying to define it to specific areas or specific uh, syndromes, just calling it long-standing groin pain and then using clinical examination and or imaging to further define what the uh, primary abnormality was. This is compounded more uh, in, in particular probably with what is termed the sportsman's hernia or inguinal uh, abnormality. And I'm only going to briefly mention this because we rarely ever see primary imaging abnormality in this area. It's a controversial clinical diagnosis with a number of clinicians not believing it exists. Again, it's compounded by many of the reported studies being of uh, very small numbers for one specific surgical technique and no real follow-up. And again, people have defined it as posterior wall weakness. Some people say it's rectus abdominis micro tears, conjoint tendon tears, external oblique tears, and external oblique tear and neuralgia. But the common thing is, is that we rarely see a primary imaging abnormality in this area, whether it's of too low resolution for us to pick up or whether it just doesn't occur, um, is difficult to say. And therefore, I just like to exclude that area from when we're uh, talking during this discussion. You should obviously always look in that area and as, you, and as you've seen with acute injuries you can get hemorrhage into that area but we don't see it with people with long-standing groin pain. So what symptoms do players get? Well usually it comes on insidiously, discomfort at the end of the game, it may then progress to aching when they wake up in the morning, it may then progress to during playing, especially with kicking and changing direction, which is termed cutting in. And it may progress to be severe enough to occur at rest and be exacerbated by sitting or sneezing. And this is why clinically, um, at some point, it was thought to be a hernia. And when they found that actually these players didn't have a hernia, they termed it a sportsman's hernia. But as I say, that terminology is probably slightly confusing and diff more important to move away from. So when we look at imaging studies, there are four main radiological findings defined around the symphysis pubis, and this is where we see the main imaging abnormalities. And these are degenerative changes around the symphyseal joint, and I'll tell you what those mean in a minute. Pubic bone marrow edema, cleft signs, and uh, pathology around the ductor muscle insertions. So cortical changes around the symphysis pubis can be just due to normal remodeling. There can be spurring, as you can see here, posteriorly. Uh, you can have irregularity around the apophysis, but usually um, these features are not significant, so you can see them in asymptomatic individuals and people as they normally age. Pubic bone marrow edema is, as it says, bone marrow edema in the pubic bodies. There can be fluid in the cleft and in the surrounding soft tissues, almost in the halo configuration, but that's pretty rare. And when we're looking at it, typically in athletes, we rarely see that florid um, change that we saw in the previous slide and also in that uh, player we saw with acute stress injury. We usually see a more subtle uh, edema following or mimicking the old apophysis. It's not an apophysitis, it's reactive bone marrow edema, but centered on the anteromedial aspect of the joint. And as you'll see, we can see this change in normal asymptomatic athletes. So it seems the grading is more significant with more severe edema, more likely to relate to symptoms. 
We did a study in Leeds and other uh, studies in footballs have shown that edema, as you can see here, can be quite common in asymptomatic footballers. So whatever footballers or soccer players do, they seem to put stress through this region. And what precipitates clinical presentation isn't yet clear. In our study, we found quite often uh, pubic bone marrow edema. We found clefts, as I'll show you later. We often saw remodeling, and you can see here, this is you know, a 16-year-old, and you can see there's quite marked remodeling of the symphysis pubis. And in the inguinal region, we also saw quite a lot of variation in canal movement, which again, in some studies, has been said to be pathological. So what is the cleft? This was first discussed um, by uh, Steve Eustace's group from Dublin, and they had this paper in radiology. And as you can see here, there's a primary cleft and a secondary cleft, which they uh, discovered through injection into the primary cleft for a therapeutic region. And again, you can see this leakage out the right side. And the theory is that this is a, a capsular disruption at this point, either a partial tear or a full thickness tear. And their point was at that point that this was a, a common finding in symptomatic individuals. Um, but as you'll see, you can see it in asymptomatic individuals too. Then there's also been a description of a superior cleft. Here you can see a left-sided cleft, but in fact the player is right-sided symptoms and they have extension into the rectus abdominis. And then if we look at adductor changes around the symphysis pubis, we really see similar findings. So here we have the symphysis pubis. It looks relatively normal across the capsule. There's no evidence of tearing. But more inferiorly on the left, you can see this high signal edema in the soft tissue between the uh, capsule and the tendons. And you can also see some more minor reactive edema in the pubis itself. And I think this is the same as the cleft sign. It's a partial or complete disruption of that tissue bank involving the uh, tendons and the capsule as they merge. And again, this finding in its severer form seems to correlate well with the side of symptoms in athletes that have long-standing groin pain. Here we have a, a cleft on the left and the same appearance on the oblique axial. And again, you can see that capsule has been lifted away or partially torn at the junction where the tendons are merging with it. And this seems one of the more reliable signs for symptoms in athletes. Adam Zoga's group have described uh, this area as the plate, as a kind of structurally important area that, if disrupted, can cause instability. Whether it truly causes um, instability is still up for further evaluation. But you can see here that this is almost like a bilateral cleft where the tissues have separated from the front of the pubis. In contrast, um, this is an asymptomatic individual and uh, who had a, an acute on chronic hamstring problem, and that's why they were imaged. But you can see we've picked up in the anterior pelvis this incidental cleft. And that's not really unsurprising, because if you think about it, if it's a partial disruption or a disruption of that capsular tissue, it will heal eventually, but it won't heal um, completely in all cases. It may have some granulation tissue. It may have a permanent defect at that detensioned uh, tear. So the fact that it's still present isn't that much of a surprise. Perhaps the areas that might help us are the lack of edema around that area, both in the bone and the soft tissues. So how does imaging influence treatment? Well, there's no proof that it does uh, the mainstay of treatment is core stabilization physiotherapy, stabilizing those muscles as the rectus abdominis and the adductor muscles as they can converge on the groin. There have been studies looking at injection that have shown a quicker response to symptoms in a number of papers. And then there's a number of uh, surgical series treating resistant athletes, but again, very few with controls and very few with long term follow-up. So in conclusion, there's still a shortage of radiological studies on athletes with long-standing groin pain. And as I've shown, hopefully, the diagnostic terminology in this area is quite confusing. 
Certainly in soccer players, which is the main uh, group of athletes affected with long-standing groin pain, you can have uh, what were previously termed positive MRI findings in asymptomatic players. And this is usually related to the symphysis and adductor insertions. And as I said to you before, the inguinal region itself is really positive in terms of imaging. If we move away from athletes that um, are predisposed to this condition and look at non-soccer playing athletes such as rowers or uh, other such uh, athletes, they rarely dis uh, display abnormality. They have normal MRI features uh, um, in the symphysis pubis. So in conclusion, what are the significant things to look for? Certainly in chronic pain, uh, remodeling of the symphysis pubis is a common normal finding and doesn't seem to offer any specific features. Uh, there's controversy with clinical evaluation of the inguinal canal and certainly in imaging terms we rarely see positive findings both on MRI and ultrasound. The two areas where we do see abnormality are as I've shown you bone marrow edema in, in the pubic body and then edema or disruption at the junction of the capsule and the adjacent muscles, be them adductors or um, the rectus muscles, and we've described what a cleft is. I'd just like to say a quick thank you to some of my um, uh, collaborators uh, in terms of providing anatomical uh, definition and clinical input. Thank you.